Okay, so I think uh, we are already two minutes late. Is the camera on? All right, good. So what we'll do is uh, last lecture, of um, course, so we will complete the two slides we had left over from last time. I'm going to do two very quick introduction to some advanced topics. We won't have time to go into details in either of those, but just to give you a flavor of some other topics that we didn't have time to cover, but are relevant to distributed systems. The first of those topics is pervasive computing, uh, IoT. The other one is multimedia systems, video streaming, and things of that sort. Okay, but before we do that, let's finish uh, the lecture from last time. We were talking about security systems. Uh, towards the end, I started introducing the notion of how crypto and security protocols can be used for uh, use payments and digital currency and so on. Okay, so one of the uh, uh, distributed systems techniques that are used for uh, modern currencies, cryptocurrencies, that is, is called blockchain. Okay, so I just want to introduce the concept of what a blockchain is uh, very quickly and just explain how cryptocurrencies use them. Okay? And a lot of this material is covered in other classes here, specifically secure distributed systems and security and so on. So I won't go into details, but but there's a reason for us to think about this from a distributed system step. Okay? So what is a blockchain? Okay? So think of a blockchain as a distributed database or a distributed ledger that is open to the uh, for viewing by the public. Okay? So like any ledger, okay, a ledger is if you know what a ledger is, really a physical version of it is a big book that has just records of various stuff. Okay? So there's a digital ledger, so it has records of various sorts, but it is also public, which means that anyone can go and verify that a record actually exists. It is cryptographically uh, signed in the sense you can verify that the, the, these are legitimate transactions and so on. Okay? Uh, and it's distributed. Okay? So that is why it is interesting from our perspective, which means that there is no single machine that holds all of the data that belongs to the ledger. This is distributed and replicated and so on, so that even if some nodes go down, the ledger as a whole continues to be available. So it uses a lot of the concepts that we've already seen, how to use replication for ensuring that uh, the data and the service remains available, how to use um, uh, cryptographic techniques to make sure that the data has not been modified by third parties and so on. And this is also an example of uh, more of a peer-to-peer server-less architecture because remember way back when we started the course, we said things are client server, peer-to-peer. -peer. Practically uh, most of the applications we have seen in the class have been a client server type system. Here there is no single server, a group of machines, you could call them peers, that collectively implement this ledger service. Okay? So it's basically a distributed public ledger of transactions. You can use it to record any transactions of any sort. Uh, there are examples of using blockchains for recording energy transactions, for recording contracts between parties, looking at supply chains that involve multiple parties. So no one party holds all of the data. Lots of different applications for it. Okay? So essentially think of it at the end of the day as a distributed database okay? that anyone can access. Uh, so as I said, stock register, land transaction, marriage record, smart contract, a lot of these applications have thought of using uh, blockchains. And the basic idea is that you can sign the transaction with a private key and insert it into the ledger. And later on, someone can go and see that you signed something. Right? So if you signed a contract, because we already know how to do digital signatures. We looked at that last time. Right? Uh, so it's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol that allows you to do this. Now, uh, blockchains became popular. Uh, they have been around for some time, but they became popular when Bitcoin was introduced as a cryptocurrency because Bitcoin used blockchains as its underlying framework. Okay? So in this cryptocurrency, coins are issued and you record in the ledger who owns the currency. It's anonymous. You don't have to actually give your identity, but you do have to have a key, okay, a private key that you use to sign it. And then you have to uh, essentially use that key to tra transfer the currency to someone else based on some financial transaction and so on. Okay? Now, in the case of Bitcoin, 
the, the blockchain is used to hold the transactions, but there is a separate protocol that runs on top that decides how the coins are generated. That is done by a process called mining, where the set of nodes come and uh, essentially participate in the blockchain protocol to record transactions and they get rewarded for their work. Okay? And every so often for doing all of the work of maintaining the, the blockchain, you, a new coin gets generated and someone in that node, uh, someone in that system gets awarded that coin. So essentially as a reward for participating in uh, maintaining this ledger, you essentially get currency in the form of a cryptocurrency that can then be part of the blockchain and used for financial transactions. Okay? And last point that uh, I want to say here is you essentially use consensus protocols to decide uh, what transactions get recorded, in what order they get recorded, and so on, okay? to make sure that transactions are validated. So all of the mining nodes, the miners, are going to maintain the blockchain for us, and they are going to run distributed consensus. Okay? But they run a more complex version of consensus than Paxos and Raft, which we looked at, okay? because this one needs to be essentially handled Byzantine failures. Okay? So you don't want bad actors to come and insert fake transactions, say, I own so much money, and now suddenly you created money out of nowhere, and the blockchain says you own so much uh, cryptocurrency and so on. So to prevent bad actors, you need to run Byzantine consensus, not normal consensus which is a lot more complicated protocol than Paxos and Ruff, but we didn't look at Byzantine consensus in this course, but there are papers that show us how to do it. And this is an example of a technique that uses it because it does need to ensure Byzantine consensus, not just straightforward consensus, because when money is involved, there can be bad actors who will do bad things. Right? So, so that's the basic idea behind blockchains very quickly. Uh, here is how a blockchain transaction is done. I mean, you don't have to go into look, look at all of the icons there, but there are three phases. The first one is you take a transaction. It could be a smart contract that you want to sign. It could be a record that you want to sign. Okay, you're going to encrypt it and sign it with your key okay? and then try to insert that into the uh, ledger saying that I want to record this in the ledger so it becomes uh, public. Okay? So then there is essentially a set of nodes that you see in the middle that are taking all of these transactions and then deciding, making sure first of all that they're legit and then deciding in what order you want to add them to the ledger because you want all of them to maintain a single ledger. And the ledger is replicated clearly because you don't want any node to go down and parts of the data disappear. So you essentially want consensus on ordering and things of that sort. So that is essentially done by these minor nodes that are sitting they are just running the blockchain protocol and then you record those transactions. Then later on the ledger, once you record it, the ledger is essentially available to the public. So you can go and verify a transaction saying, does this person actually own this money or did you sign that contract? So that can be essentially done once the recording of the transaction. Okay, so that's essentially a three-step process of how you can maintain a distributed ledger. Okay? Lots of details that we are glossing over here, the consensus protocol that's used here, the encryption techniques that are used to sign the transactions, how do you verify that the transaction actually exists. All of that is part of the protocol. But the high level idea is we are going to use several of the techniques we already know to build this blockchain based public ledger. Okay? So that's blockchain and then I just want to show you one slide on Bitcoin, because we talked very briefly about digital currency last time. Okay? So it was more conventional digital currency, but what you see today are essentially this cryptocurrency. Okay? So cryptocurrencies are not money that some government has issued. Okay? This is essentially a, uh, some entity that decided to create a new type of currency. They use, in this case, it's Bitcoin, and they use a blockchain-based mechanism to record Okay, they are essentially going to issue the currency some, in some manner. In Bitcoin, the currency is generated as part of the mining process, but there are other approaches for other currencies to do this. Okay, and then once you do that, you're going to put it in the ledger, and then you can essentially use that to uh, purchase things uh, based on who is going to accept it. Okay, so in most cases, uh, you have to basically convert it to real cash to actually buy goods, but there are some merchants that will directly accept 
uh, uh, these types of digital currencies. Okay? So you essentially use the blockchain to track your transactions. You are going to hold these coins in a digital wallet. So you are going to record using a private key that is, you own it, but your identity is not in the ledger. It's just there's a signature of some party that says this entity, you can think of the person having a number, owns it, but then you have your own wallet that essentially keeps track of all your currency, which is what you're going to use in order to trade it and so on. Okay? And then if you make payments and so on, they're going to be recorded in the transaction that involves transferring your currency to someone else using the same digital transaction that's going to be recorded saying, I transfer $1 of currency to somebody else because I'm making a payment and then that person is going to own the currency. Okay, So that's the basic process. I'm going to just pause here to see if there are any questions before we switch to today's lecture. Any questions on this? Okay. So what we'll do now is spend a little time talking about pervasive computing and IoT, and then uh, talk about uh, uh, how you can implement these systems and so on. Okay, so, so we've seen all kinds of distributed systems already in this course. Okay? So this is essentially distributed systems became pervasive because you can may put computation in everywhere and on anything that you can buy these days. Okay? You can buy a smart toothbrush that actually has a a computing capability on it and communication capability. You can put these on your watches that you have smart tells. You can put them in infrastructures of buildings. You can put them on transportation uh, vehicles and roads. You can put them into systems that are used in agriculture. So computing and communication have become so inexpensive. Hardware has become so cheap that you can embed computing everywhere. Okay? So all of these systems are now essentially not just single computing devices, but they're part of a larger system that makes them distributed systems of some sort. Okay? Your TV has compute capability because it's a smart TV. Okay? Uh, and, and your car has the same kind of capability and your, of course your phone has quite a bit of compute capability. So, so all of these devices have sensing and communication and computing capabilities. So we need to really think about distributed systems more broadly than our client server systems and web applications and all of the ones you've seen so far. Okay? So now computing has become pervasive and distributed systems have also become pervasive. Okay? So this has given rise to what is called the internet of things or IOT, which basically means and things here mean physical objects that have computing and communication capabilities embedded in them. And they have in capability to communicate with others on the internet, which is why it's called Internet of Things, okay? or IoT. For a long time, that was industry jargon, but now it has actually become more commonplace. So uh, we use that now everywhere okay, as, a, as a term. So what is IoT? It basically means miniaturization of computing, sensors with communication, computing capability get embedded everywhere. Okay, so, so practically any device you can buy, there's some smart version of it. There's a smart washing machine you can buy and a smart microwave. Amazon had an Alexa powered microwave at one point. They stopped selling it, but it was one of those things you could buy. Okay? So, it, so essentially any device that you have for physical use, there is a tendency to now add some compute capabilities and communication capabilities so you can control it with your phone, you can control it with voice commands and so on. Okay? So all of that gives rise to this notion of Internet of Things, which is a network of physical devices that can do interesting things. And I'm going to give you three more detailed examples. Then we'll look at architectures for building IoT systems. Okay? So first domain is smart health. Okay? So there's quite a bit of work in this domain where you can build all kinds of interesting devices to monitor people and their health. Okay, that's the basic goal here. So you've probably seen the Fitbits and the smart watches and Apple watches and all of those. So those are the most common examples, but there are a lot more. You can think of all kinds of devices that you can uh, you use for monitoring patients' health. There are, uh, for people with diabetes, there are devices that monitor their blood glucose in real time okay, and alert them if it is crossing some threshold and also alerts the doctor so that they can see how their patients are doing. Okay? As one example of monitoring your health in real time, all the time. Okay? 
And there are other examples. Here is an example of a shoe uh, that has a sensor in it. So you can actually monitor uh, how the person is walking. And maybe these are older people who have gait problems. So you can monitor their gait and so on. Uh, that the other one there is what you wear on your arm and it can monitor your blood pressure and all kinds of other things in real time. Okay? And so that's these things are now getting embedded into clothing. So you don't actually have to wear a separate sensor. The sensor is integrate, integrated into your clothing. So it will monitor you as you go about your daily life. Okay? That's one example. Smart glasses, the same thing. This is now becoming more interesting from an AR, VR perspective. But there are medical uses of smart glasses where they monitor your eyes for fatigue when you're driving long distances and things of that sort, neurological disorder. So these are glasses that look at your eyes, not glasses that look at the world, which is what AR and VR glasses are going to do. Okay? So those are examples of these IoT devices in smart health. Uh, you've probably seen some of this in smart buildings. So the simplest one here is a smart plug. You can go out on Amazon and buy this for $10. So you put, plug that into a socket and then you plug anything into that, uh, so into this smart plug, and then you can control it with a phone. Okay? You can essentially turn it on or off with a phone. You can monitor the power consumption with the phone. A very simple example of how you can use Internet of Things to control devices, uh, turn them on or off, basically. Okay? So there are uh, air conditioning and heating systems that have all kinds of capability. That thing there is a thermostat that Google sells. It's called the Nest thermostat. It has, uh, they call it a smart thermostat because it has learning capabilities. It can learn your uh, daily patterns and program itself. It will turn off automatically when you leave the house because it's learned when you come in and when you leave and so on. Okay, so it has that type of capabilities. You can get fridge that has all these smart appliances. You can get smart locks, all kinds of devices. Practically anything you buy in the house now has this capability. And then there are ways to interface with those devices. The simplest one is through a phone. So you have a mobile app that allows you to control them. But more uh, recent ones are all spoken command. Okay? Kind of Alexa or Siri or Google Assistant that all allow you to just say something, saying turn on the lights, and it will interface with those devices and turn them on. Okay. So that's the way some of these interactions are taking place just through spoken commands. Okay. That's one, another domain, which is smart buildings. There are lots of these devices that help you conserve energy. Okay. These are more convenience devices. Just you want to turn things on or off with your phone, but there are many that are designed specifically to reduce the energy consumption of a building and so on as well. Okay. Last one is uh, transportation. Uh, so here you have two kinds of sensors. One, are, uh, one is sensors that are embedded in roads okay, that are monitoring traffic that can alert other traffic if there are hazardous conditions on road. Maybe there's ice or there are in potholes or whatever the problem may be on the road or maybe the road is just congested. There's been accident as a backup. So the road monitors traffic and then there are cars and vehicles that also have, have devices on them. Okay, so these are not even self-driving vehicles. These are standard, normal vehicles that just have a lot of sensors that can communicate with other, other vehicles that can communicate with uh, the road and the road infrastructure to do interesting uh, optimization. It monitor the traffic, reroute traffic if there are problems, alert drivers if there is a problem on the road, all kinds of things that increase safety and efficiency. Okay? Now, all of this, uh, of course, if you take it to the next level, you have autonomous vehicles where the vehicle also drives itself. That has even more sensors on it that can in real time decide, decide how to drive the car and what. Okay, so, but this has been around even before the autonomous vehicles essentially came about. Okay, so three domains. And then what I'm going to show you is, although these look like lots of different applications, lots of different domains, the underlying distributed systems architecture okay, is not very different. They all basically use the same set of ideas. Okay, so we'll now abstract this out and see what is involved in designing these different types of applications. Okay, so here's one example uh, where you have a device that uses a phone, that the phone sends data to the cloud or basically uses the cloud to interact with the device. Okay? And here's another device that uses a gateway device and then it goes to the cloud. 
So essentially, what you will see is there is a cloud backend that is essentially powering all of these applications. Okay? And so what does that mean from our perspective? So you can think about the architecture of these IoT devices in one of a few different ways. Okay? The standard approach is that you have an IoT device that has some networking capability and it has a backend component. So it is either sending all of its data to the cloud and the cloud is processing all of that data. You can send commands to it from the cloud and the, to the cloud it will basically signal the device to do something. Okay? That's called a uh, two-tier cloud-based IoT architecture. Okay? Most of the devices that you can just buy off the shelf use this as the baseline capability. Okay? As a device that is connected to the internet, you can connect it through Bluetooth and a gateway, it might have Wi-Fi capabilities, some way it has networking capability and then some part of the application is running on the back end. Okay? That's our distributed system, not client server system, essentially it's a device cloud system, the same idea. Okay? So that's the first approach. Okay? Second approach is with emergence of edge computing. Okay? You can essentially put an intermediary between the cloud and the device, so you have an edge node sitting in between. Okay? The edge node can do some interesting things for the device, on the previous case, you saw that you can even have a phone as an intermediary. Okay? That's not a real edge, but because your watch just has simple Bluetooth capability, it can't directly send data to the internet, it doesn't have IP. So it's sending its data to the phone. A phone is acting as a proxy, it collects the data, but phone has internet capability, so it will upload it to the cloud. That's one example. And here is another example where this plug actually talks to a gateway device, okay, which has the more capabilities and the gateway device talks to the cloud. So there are these intermediaries that can sit between the device and the cloud, which will give us a three-tier architecture. Okay? There's a device edge cloud architecture as opposed to just a device cloud architecture. Okay? And so we already seen proxy servers, we saw some notion of edge computing. This is basically one scenario where it has become quite popular to help IoT devices uh, do whatever they need to do because they don't have the capability themselves. These are low-end devices. Some of them don't have Wi-Fi capability or networking capability. Okay? So, so that, that is essentially a, another popular model. But what is now becoming more popular in recent years is to take these nodes, both the device, the edge, and the cloud, and as, add specialized hardware to them that enables them to do things a lot better or a lot more efficient. Okay? So you can put specialized hardware like accelerators, which I'll talk about on the device. You can put them on the edge, edge node or the edge cloud. You can also put things like FPGAs and powerful GPUs in the cloud, which means that you can specialize all of these three tiers to do spe specific things. And I'm going to show you some examples. Okay? So here is an example of what you can put at the edge tier, okay? you can do similar things both at the device tier and the cloud tier. Okay? So what can you do at the edge tier? Okay? So there is this whole notion of accelerators, which we really didn't touch upon much in this course, but they've become very popular okay? that you can add to standard computing device. Okay? So what is an accelerator? An accelerator is a piece of hardware that is designed to speed up one specific task. Okay? Unlike a CPU, which is general purpose, it can do arbitrary compute, think of an accelerator as a special purpose processor. Okay? It can do certain things very well and it's only designed to do certain things very well, unlike CPUs which are general purpose processors. Okay? So what can you do with accelerator? So they have, been, they have become popular in a variety of different contexts. You can get crypto accelerators, for example. Okay? That will essentially speed up security operations, which tend to be very compute intensive. Okay? Last class I was talking about using public keys and private keys and encryption, all of that adds an overhead. So you can build a processor that is only going to accelerate security operation. It cannot do anything else. Okay? Everything else is done by the main processor. Okay? Those are called crypto accelerators. So you can get network accelerators that are essentially designed to speed up TCP IP. Okay? So that the entire processor is essentially doing network operation to speed up transmission and receive. Okay? as your networks get faster and faster, rather than running TCP IP code in the kernel on general purpose CPU, you can just offload it to the special purpose chip 
that's all it's doing is essentially uh, uh, network operation. So those are network accelerators. Okay? And what is shown here, these three pictures are essentially AI accelerators. Okay? They are designed specifically to run machine learning or deep learning models. Okay? So this one is called Google's HTPU that essentially is designed for vision tasks. Okay? You can give it vision-based deep learning models and it'll run them in hardware for you. Okay? So it'll run it much, much faster okay, than running it on a general purpose process. Okay? Here's another one. This is called NVIDIA's Jetson Nano GPU. Okay? It's a small GPU, unlike the big GPUs you find on uh, processors. Small GPU okay, takes five watts of power okay, and it can essentially run all kinds of deep learning models inference, not training. Okay, this is not, these are not used for training. They're mostly do, using uh, trained models and executing them. And it can run it really fast, okay? much faster than you can run them on a seat. And you can put these devices on edge nodes. You can put them on uh, actually IoT devices themselves and so on. Okay? And the last example here is Apple's neural engine, which you may have heard of. Okay? So this is there on every iPhone. Okay? All of the iPhones that you can buy now essentially have a chip that is designed to accelerate machine learning tasks. So any ML task that you want to run on a phone, you can offload that to the neural engine that will speed things up, okay? things like tensor operation and all kinds of common operations that you run, you can essentially offload them to a neural engine rather than offloading them to a more general GPU. Okay? So these are some examples, there are many more of these. Okay? These are just three examples uh, that there are, uh, these basically are used for accelerating machine learning tasks. Okay? Now, why am I mentioning this? From an IoT context, okay, these accelerators have become very useful. Okay? Because if you think about this, what are these devices doing? These devices have sensors on them. They are producing data. That data was normally sent to the cloud for processing. Okay? Maybe it's still sent to the cloud, but you can now use the edge to process this data and often what is processing this data is some model that you trained previously and is just running, that, uh, uh, that model is run on the data to figure out what is going. Maybe you are doing, uh, using the model to do, figure out when the user slept and when they woke up based on whatever their wearable device was sensing from their heart rate or something like that. So that's a classification task. You can essentially run that on, a, uh, on one of these devices or Maybe you have a home security camera. Okay? Many of these security cameras can now essentially do real-time face detection. Okay? So you can train them and say, these are the people in the house. Okay? And you give them their faces and it learns them. And if it now finds the face that is from a stranger, it will send you an alert. Okay? So it's taking video and it's in real time trying to run face recognition. Okay? So normally if you send a lot of video to the cloud, that's a lot of bandwidth you spend and use processing in the cloud you could instead run all of that on one of these devices uh, that is essentially the edge and get your results much faster and so on. Okay? So specialized edge computing is essentially become a good way to help IoT devices do their job faster and lower latency, maybe lower uh, with lower amounts of energy and things of that sort. So they allow you to run efficient inference on resource constraint edge server, okay? which goes back to what I was saying here. So all of those devices sit at this tier. Okay? So you can put them here. So IoT device just sends that data there and then you process it there. You don't have to send it to the cloud. Okay? Now, more recently you have versions of these devices that you can directly put on the device itself. So you can do on-device processing. Okay? So you will see now that there are research papers on doing on-device AI. You generate data and you process it there. You don't have to send it anywhere. Your model is running where the data is produced. So that also requires accelerators. So you can put these accelerators, which are low power on the device itself. So you never even have to send the data anywhere. Okay? So you can think about this as one way to improve privacy because you're not giving your data to anyone. You would process it locally inside your house and so on. Okay? Uh, so, so in any case, I think you have these specialized architectures, but by and large, you will have a device cloud or a device edge cloud or a device proxy cloud architecture to help us with all of this. Okay. Any questions here? Okay. So specialized edge computing. So let me show you a little bit of details for the sensor platforms that are running on the device itself. So 
these are think of them as tiny computers okay just as your computer has a processor memory network and so on that's exactly what is on the iot device okay it has a small cpu okay typically it's called a microcontroller because the cpus are really tiny it has some sort of a wireless radio for communication that could be bluetooth or it could be some other protocol and it has sensors okay so you are sensing you can communicate and you can produce some local processing not a whole lot okay some of them may be battery powered some of them could be self powered some of them you just plug into ac power there are various ways to power these devices depending on the domain okay and of course that can have also a little bit of storage if you want to keep some data local okay so whatever you see on our servers and clients so far you are going to see the same thing but on a much tinier scale in a more resource constrained manner on uh, on these uh, devices so here is an example of a very low end processor okay it's an 8 bit processor okay normally we have now 64 bit so these devices might have a very low end processor 8 bit there's only 4 kilobytes of memory okay not megabytes 4 kilobytes of memory so any application you write actually has to be smaller than 4 kilobyte otherwise it won't even fit in memory and can't run okay so as you can see and it might have as much as 128 kilobytes of storage space okay that's not ram but that's uh, space that you uh, have to keep any data so any program that you are going to see that's running on these end devices okay they are running on really tiny devices okay they they can't they don't have much capability because how much code can you execute in 4 kilobytes okay that's the entire program os everything is running in on that so so these are very low end devices which is why they need to send their data to either the cloud or the edge to do processing was this you can barely do data collection with these types of devices and processor of course you can put more capable devices then the power requirements goes up the cost goes up for those devices so for certain applications you can put in more than this but these are the things kinds of things you'll find on a smart plug and very low end devices that you can buy okay and here is another one that is the texas instrument msp430 popular one little more capable but not very much more 16 bit as opposed to 8 bit 10 kilobytes of ram this 48 kilobyte flash and so on okay still quite tiny as as processors go okay? just to give you some sense of what is on these devices and then you have the arm family these are the ones that you find on a raspberry pi class device okay so those will be 32 even 64 bit okay although the old one side only megabytes now if you buy a raspberry pi it can have 1 gigabyte 4 gigabytes of ram so it start looking like more of a normal low end processor as opposed to something really tiny okay so you can get this entire family depending on the device uh, on them and then same is true of your uh, communication capability okay so you will see that the modern devices might have wifi but lot of them have protocols like called zigbee which you may not even have heard of but that looks like a protocol like uh, bluetooth essentially it is a, a 2.4 gigahertz wireless protocol for short range communication not not longer range uh, bluetooth has a version called low power bluetooth okay uh, so that's the one that many of these devices are beginning to use so if you have apple's home kit device compatible devices those have switched to bluetooth okay they don't use things like zigbee or other kinds of specialized protocols but whatever the protocol may be okay the communication is short range because the the radio that you can put on the device the wireless radio has low power okay because it, so it can't communicate for long distances so you can essentially send data to either a nearby phone a nearby gateway and then that gateway has to communicate and these typically don't run ip okay so it's not going to run a full fledged tcp ip stack it's going to use some stripped down network stack then you can send this data to an ip capable device and communicate okay that's our communication capability okay. and then finally sensors okay so you will see that there are all kinds of sensors that are available that you can equip them on these devices you can monitor temperature humidity vibration the amounts of light okay motion sensors are very capable kind of imaging sensors which are cameras accelerometer gps all kinds of sensors okay so uh, lidar and other th things as well and what sensor you use depends on the application 
And these are not even listing the health sensors that you have on health or wearable devices, because those are a separate class of sensors that are used to design uh, or used to monitor things like heart rate and uh, other health parameters. So these are environmental sensors that are used to monitor the environment, the health domain, there are a whole other class of sensors. So the basic idea is to make an IoT device, you first have the application, you decide what sensors you want, you have a processor, you have communication storage, and you put the device together. Okay? And then you build a device for a specific task. And it only does that task. It can't really do other things. because it's specific to a particular application. Okay? Any questions on this? Okay. There's a very quick overview of the world of IoT. Okay? It's a very active area of research. There's lots of work going on in uh, building all kinds of applications, building better platforms, and so on. So it's a rich space. A lot of the work is also now gone down the machine learning path because it's more interesting to do something with the data than build a platform to collect the data because that people have done for more than 15 years. So now how can you build better models to do better uh, data processing? I think that's where a lot of the emphasis is, which is why those uh, ML accelerators that I've been talking or I was just talking about have become very popular. I'm going to switch gears and talk about multimedia computing. Any questions on IoT and pervasive computing? Okay, so let's talk about the very last uh, topic in the course, which is video streaming and multimedia. Okay, so uh, all of the message-oriented communication that we have seen so far okay, have been request-response. Okay? You essentially have clients send a request to the server, the server comes back with a response. Okay? That is a valid way of communication for a very large class of application, okay? but not for multimedia applications that use audio and video streaming. That is not typically how audio and video streaming works. What happens in audio and video streaming is you can, okay, so, so the early days of audio and video streaming, you essentially sent a request to a server saying, play this video or play this audio, and the server would then use server push to send data. Okay? You think about request response, that's really client pull. The request is sent by the client, and then the server does something. Okay? For audio and video streaming, what you would do is you just send an initial play request, and then the video would be sent to you. Okay? So that's one difference between standard client-server applications and things like streaming applications. Okay? And we'll see that there is now a hybrid approach, but let's hold off on that for a moment. The other more important thing is in video streaming, okay, timing is very critical. Okay? The, if you don't receive the video data in time, okay, then you're going to see a playback glitch. Okay? Your, play, your video playback will freeze because the data hasn't arrived from the server. Okay? And so timing is very crucial, and that is something that we'll have to deal with as we send data over a network, because the network is going to be best effort. Okay, so with the way you want to think about why timing is crucial is, if you take a standard video file, okay? Okay, so video, video data essentially is a sequence of images. Okay? A video, if you look inside a video file, essentially it's lots of images that were captured, okay? and as you play those images, you will essentially each image is slightly different from the previous image and you see motion because you can actually see people moving in the scene or whatever the scene may be. Okay? So since the video data is a sequence of images, you got to play it at a rate at which it was captured. And typical capture rates are things like 30 frames per video or 30 frames per second video, which means there are 30 images being played every second. Okay? So if you take this video, then the server has to send you enough data for the next 30 images every second. Okay? And the next second you need to have received the next 30 images. So if you look at a single JPEG image, which you probably have seen, think of 30 of them inside a file every second that are being sent to. So typically video data tends to be much higher bandwidth than uh, normal data. But the important thing is if you are not get, if you don't receive the next 30 frames in the next second, you will run out of data to play out. Okay? So your player will just freeze because he's waiting for more data to arrive. And you may have seen this if you're playing YouTube or something occasionally or even Netflix or any of your streaming services, your network quality isn't good. 
your playback might freeze okay and then it'll, you'll see this thing spinning and then after a while it might resume and so on what has actually happened is your player ran out of data to show you because the data didn't arrive in time from the server okay now this is less of a problem in let's say web applications if instead of getting a response in 100 milliseconds if it takes 300 milliseconds it just feels a little slower but the application doesn't just stop because it just took 100 milliseconds more here that kind of problem can actually cause a user experience issue okay so the main issue that we want to deal with is how can you ensure that data from the server actually comes to the client on time so you can play it on i mean this is called isochronous communication okay data transfers have a maximum bound on the end to end delay if the delay keeps increasing data will not arrive on time okay so that's the first thing and then the second thing is a concept called jitter which i'm going to explain in just a moment jitter is the variation in the delay okay if you have a steady amount of delay that's fine the delay itself keeps changing that causes further problems and i'll show you an example of this in just a second okay but let's look at two types of streaming that is very common okay one is called live streaming the other is called st uh, play, uh, streaming of stored video okay live streaming is something like video conferencing if you use zoom you use facetime or you use any of the standard video conferencing applications on your phone that's live okay so there are at least two parties okay that are communicating with each other okay on each end there is a camera and a microphone that's capturing your video and audio and it is being sent to the other party okay that's what happens when you try to facetime someone when you have a zoom call with another party that's what is going to happen okay so here there are very strict requirements on the end to end delay okay because the data has to be captured when you speak at the other on one end it has to be captured encoded transmitted and then shown at the other end okay in real time okay if you have actual audio in any communication the latency is very strict if you don't receive the data from the other end in less in about 200 milliseconds okay you start seeing a lag because the audio is real time okay so you will say are you start saying something then somebody else says something and you don't get that data in time then you get confused you start speaking over them and all kinds of bad things happen okay so in live conferencing the end to end requirements are very strict the data has to come to you in less than 150 to 200 milliseconds otherwise you start seeing that the quality is suffering because there's a lag you say something and the person is not responding to you okay so, so that's how uh, live conferencing uh, live video conferencing and live streaming work okay and then there is this other approach which is not live in the sense of the data is not captured in real time it's a movie that you are playing from a server okay so that's a little bit different in that you want the data to arrive steadily but it doesn't have a very strict end to end requirements like you have here even if the data takes 300 milliseconds to come so long as it's coming steadily that's all you care about okay you hit play and you expect that playback to start in some reasonable time maybe hundreds of millisecond couple of seconds but you don't have those strict requirements of live streaming okay and the other thing in this case is you might be having one server that's serving lots of users Okay, so I think of YouTube may have tens of thousands or millions of users watching a stream at any given time, depending on what the stream is, if it's a popular webcast or, or some other type of stream. Okay? So, so here you have stored video and then you have live video. They have kind of somewhat different requirements, but both of them are still somewhat real time have timing characteristics. Okay? So we'll talk more about this case, which is the stored video and a little less about the video conferencing in real time in the next few slides okay but we'll start talking about what are the requirements on video transmission okay so essentially when you have video streaming you want to give good quality streaming experience to your users okay you don't want pay playback glitches you don't want the video to degrade and so on so the way you specify these requirements is through something you call quality of service that says Here's the quality I expect from my video streaming service. Okay. Quality of service is a term, it's called QoS. If you ever heard hear this term QoS, it means quality of service. And that essentially means there are some requirements on the minimum quality service 
you are expecting to see from the server. Okay. So for video streaming, there are a few different metrics you can specify. You can say, I can tolerate a maximum delay of so much before you start playback. The maximum end-to-end -end delay cannot exceed 200 milliseconds or in, in things like FaceTime, it has to be 150 milliseconds. That's my end-to-end. -end, okay? uh, there I, I can in, uh, put a, uh, a bound on the variance in the delay, a variance delay called jitter. Okay? So what does that mean? So let's say it's one packet took 10 uh, milliseconds to come from the one end to the other, the other one took 12 and then yet, yet another one took 8. So the amount of delay keeps fluctuating. That fluctuation is called jitter. Okay? You want to minimize jitter as well because we'll see that uh, more jitter actually cause more problems in playback. Okay? And you want a maximum amount of the bound on the round trip time because maybe it's two-way conferencing. Okay? You are actually doing FaceTime as opposed to broadcast. Okay? So these are all metrics that you can specify on the quality of transmissions you expect from the video or the network. Okay? So these are all network parameters. You can also have bandwidth requirements saying this is HD video okay? or this is standard definition SD video. They have very different bandwidth requirement. So you can specify that I need a, a network connection of at least this much uh, megabits per second for me to watch a high quality video versus maybe a little bit lower quality video. Okay? So all kinds of metrics which I won't go into a whole lot. I'm going to talk about one called token bucket in just a second. So you'll see that there's a delay, there's a loss, or there's a loss is the other problem. You don't want packet loss because there's no time to retransmit. Okay? In uh, normal client-server communication, if a packet is lost, TCP will retransmit it for you. Okay? In video transmissions, by the time TCP retransmit, the time to play that data has already come and gone. So it's uh, not receiving data is... Uh, uh, is something that you have to deal with because you have no time to retransmit anything. So, so you want essentially bound the loss rate as well. Okay, so all of this makes video a more demanding application okay, from a distributed system stand. Okay? But let me explain one way we can uh, essentially allow the network to control how much resources it gives to a video stream. Okay? There are many approaches to do all kinds of quality of service things. Here's just one example. And this is called a token bucket. Okay? Now, the reason I'm mentioning this, this example as opposed to others is the notion of token bucket is actually a more uh, broader concept than something that is just used in video streaming. Okay? It's an approach that allows the operating system or the network to assign a certain amount of bandwidth to any network stream or any network transmission. Okay? And let me explain what the concept is and then we can go back and try to understand it a little better. So here's an application. Okay? In our case, a video application, but it doesn't have to be from a token buckets perspective. That application wants to send some data over the network. Okay? And you say, I am going to guarantee this application one megabit per second bandwidth. Okay? So you can send up to a megabit per second, but not more. Okay? So you want to cap, you say, I guarantee you this much, so you can send up to this, but not more. So now you want the network or the OS to be able to enforce that requirement. So you can send up to this much, but you, I'm not going to let you exceed that cap. Okay? So how do you do it? Okay, just as when we are talking about virtualization, I said you could uh, guarantee a certain amount of CPU. We looked at fair share schedulers, you remember. Okay? Now the same virtual machine, you can also guarantee it as some amount of bandwidth. Okay? You can say, it has this Ethernet, uh, logical Ethernet card that has 300 megabits per second connection. The way you are actually going to implement that is the same approach, the token bucket. Here we are looking at this from a video streaming perspective, but this is a more common concept. So what does this do? Okay. A token bucket is an abstraction that, has, that allows you to specify two parameters. You can specify a rate R, okay, that's the bandwidth R, and then you can specify a burst B. Okay. So these are the two parameters that you can specify for a token bucket. Okay. The rate essentially says that is the rate at which you can send data. Okay. The burst B says I can temporarily send higher than that rate, but I'm going to limit the time for which you can exceed that rate. Okay. And so that's the burst. Okay. And here is how it works. This is why this is called a 
token bucket, sometimes also called the leaky bucket. Okay? So the way you think about this, okay, the whole thing is you think of a bucket, okay? it has a bunch of tokens. Okay? And we'll assume that the bucket is leaking. So the tokens are falling out at a steady rate. Okay? And the rate at which the tokens fall out of the bucket, if you think of a bucket that has holes, so the water coming out. So there's a rate at which it's leaking, right? So same thing. So you put some tokens in them and tokens are falling out. They're falling out at a rate R. Okay? And then the bucket has a depth. That depth is B. So you can hold up to B tokens in there, but not more. Okay? But that's the size of the bucket. So the bucket has a capacity B and it has a this leaking at the rate of R. Okay? So that's your abstraction you want to keep in mind. Okay? Now, how is this going to be used? Let's say the network, I mean, the application generates a packet. Okay? Our rule with the token bucket is every packet must grab a token before it can be sent on the network. Okay? So normally when you do TCP IP, you just open a socket and you just write something and the network just sends it. Okay? In this case, we are going to control the rate at which you can send data. Okay? When you essentially try to send data, the OS will say the, the packet has to first grab a token that's coming out of the bucket before you can actually get sent on the network. Okay? So what does that mean? Okay, because tokens are escaping at a rate of R, okay, you are essentially going to send at no more than that rate because you can't grab more than that. Okay? But occasionally, if you want to send more data, okay, you can at most send B packets at once because the, if the bucket is full, there are B tokens in it. Okay? So I can generate B packets they'll grab all of the tokens and then they'll go out on the network. That's okay, because each packet needs a token. Okay? But once the bucket is empty, then I either have to wait for a token to be generated. Tokens are being generated at the rate of R and they're essentially being put in the bucket. They're also escaping at the rate of R. Okay? So, so the generation rate is R, so I can send at, in the, in the uh, average case, I can send at a rate of R. Okay. In the instantaneous case, I can send at a, uh, B, B packets all at once. Okay. So this allows me to control how much data I can send. Okay. So let me show you a uh, small picture to explain how this is going to work. So let us say this is time t. Okay. So this line is going to be So this is the equation of the line. So if you have a rate of R and a burst of B, if you look at uh, the, this picture, so this is a graph, that's an equation of a line where the slope is R and the y-intercept is B. Okay, so this is the y-intercept. Okay. So what this is telling us is mathematically, this token bucket is going to bound the number of the data transmission under this line. So you can essentially send no higher than that line. So that's basically going to be a bound at any time t, I would have at most sent r times t plus b packets. Okay, because that's basically the rate at which I'm generating tokens and I can send a maximum number of packets of b. Okay. So this is a mathematical abstraction that is going to bound the amount of data that any application can send. That application could be a virtual machine, by the way. In our case, this application is a video stream. And the video stream has certain bandwidth requirements. So we will say that this is essentially how I can control how much video data gets sent for each stream that the server is sending out. Okay, so you can associate this token bucket. You can so give it a rate R and give it a rate B, and then that's it. Then you will control that rate. Okay? And you can assign any R or B. Okay? So for example, if you set the B to be zero, what does that mean? Yes. It means there's no bursts, so that uh, it's just the, uh, that one steady rate of the y intercept. So if the b is uh, zero, the y intercept is zero, you can never send a burst. This says I can only send fixed rate traffic at rate r. I cannot do anything better than that. Right? So I can only send at the rate of r. But if I want to instantaneously let the application send a little more, I can set a non zero b, in which case I can occasionally send a burst of packet, but my average rate is still R because that's the slope of that line. Okay. 
Is that clear? What this token bucket does? So this is a this is an analogous abstraction to fair share schedulers, which is used in the CPU world to controls amount of CPU allocation. This is used in the networking side to control the amount of network resource allocation. Okay, yes, question. Okay, question is, the client is trying to stream a movie, where would the token bucket be actually put? Okay, now this abstraction you can implement in many different places. One is, you can put it at the server end, the server can't send you more than that data. You can put it in the network router, so you can now control how much data is flowing through the router. Typically, you don't want to put it at the client end. Okay? So that's how you can think about this. Now, having said all this, okay, what you got to realize is, the internet is a best effort service. There is no token bucket in the internet. Okay? This abstraction is available to us. Okay? It was designed and video streaming became popular, but it was never put inside the network because the network has no concept of guaranteeing anything. Okay? Internet guarantees you nothing. You can send whatever you want. If the internet is congested, it's going to drop your packet. There is so, so this always a nice abstraction never actually got deployed at large scale in the internet. It is used on a single machine okay, in things like virtualization or VM platforms to control how much allocation you give to a VM and so on. It's used in cloud data centers, but it is actually not used for video streaming, even though it was designed from that perspective. Now, God seen other users. But in a hypothetical world where the network could give you bandwidth resources, you would put it either at the server's network interface card or you would put at the first router where the server is sending data. Okay? But it's not done that way, just to be clear. Right? Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay, because question is the token bucket is a rate limiter. It is called a rate regulator. So it is indeed a rate limiter. And the question is how is the burst able to control thing, right? So first thing is there are two parameters. There's a rate and there's a burst, okay? The rate is controlled by the rate parameter, not by the burst parameter. So if you want one megabit per second rate, you generate tokens at one, meg one million tokens per second, assuming one per packet is of certain size, right? So, so the rate parameter controls the amount of bandwidth you get. Okay? If you want to send it a fixed bandwidth, the bandwidth is not variable, the burst parameter can be set to zero. Okay? In which case, you're going to send at that rate. There is no need to have a burst at all. Okay? But not all network flows send at a fixed rate. They need some flexibility to send a little more data occasionally and so on. So to allow that flexibility, you can add a small burst. The burst doesn't have to be large. You can set the burst to be 100. So it says every once in a while I can send instead of one packet every so often I can send maybe more than one packet, 10 packets, 100 packets, depending on the burst set. But that does not mean that I can all the time send bursty data. That's every once in a while. As soon as your bucket becomes empty, you are limited to the rate. Only if the tokens have accumulated because you are sending less than your rate, will you be able to send a burst. Okay? So think of burst as a, some extra the tokens you're uh, saved to send at a higher rate than your normal rate. That's what it means. Okay. Yes. So, is it that uh, same that can be very high, it's higher than the rates of the burst, and then that drops that when you start losing the burst? Yeah. So the issue is a question is the traffic goes up, then you start using the burst, and then when your traffic goes down your bucket will start because you're generating at a rate of one token every one over r second. If you, if you send lower than your rate, tokens will fill up because you're not taking those tokens from the bucket at the rate at which they're generated. They will start accumulating them up to B because that's the depth of the bucket. So if you send less than your rate, as you pointed out, you will get more tokens that have been generated. Okay? This question there is. So what is your question? Can, if they're not implementing them on the... Yeah, a good question. The question is, 
if you are not implementing things on the client side, can the OS resources be used by a single application? If you are using best effort approaches, any application can go and hog any amount of resources you want. Okay? That's true on the CPU. You can literally start an infinite loop application, start it, it will start using all the CPU, even though there are other applications running. You can start an application, you can create a UDP socket, and you can start dumping as much data as you want, and it will use your entire network bandwidth, and all other applications will not be able to send. Okay? So any either greedy application or misbehaving application can always hog resources in a general purpose OS. But general purpose OS does not limit how much an application can use. If you want to limit, then you have to either use a fair scheduler, you can use network token buckets. So all the mechanisms exist. It is just that general purpose operating systems don't use. So in your example, yes, if you start five video streams or whatever, you can, that application can just take up all of the network resources. That is because there's no limit that the OS has imposed. Even though we know how to do it, they just don't use them. Okay. Anything else? Yes. What, what's the bucket capacity? Bucket capacity is B. That's the depth of the bucket. Okay, question is, won't there be more than B? So let me explain again how the token bucket works. The tokens are generated at a rate of R per second. Okay? They go and they sit in the bucket. Okay? The maximum capacity of the bucket is B. If you generate more than B tokens, they're wasted. Okay? So once the bucket fills up, if you don't send any data, the bucket will fill up. Once there are B tokens that are in the bucket, okay, then if you generate more to tokens at rate of one or R, you just do, can't add them anymore. So it can, you can at most have a reserve token capacity of B. Okay? That's the basic idea. So that, that is why you can send at most B packets per second. And in the long term, you can essentially send one packet every one over R second because that's your actual rate. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right. So back to video streaming. So here is the example of what was mentioned. So you could put this where the question was, where would you put this? So you can put this at the server. Okay. And you could also do something at the client if you so wanted. But as I said, in the world of internet, none of this is actually implemented. Everything is best effort. Okay? So now what we want is, although we have techniques that allow us to guarantee sending rates and so on, because the internet doesn't do any of that, how can we still give good experience to our users? Okay? The internet will have arbitrary delay. It will have arbitrary jitter. Packets might start getting lost. Yet you want to try to give some good experience to the user. How do we do it? Okay. So here's an example of how your packet transmissions can cause problems. Okay. So the, the x-axis here is time. So small gray boxes are packets. Okay. So the top line there is essentially the rate at which the server is sending video data. Okay. Assume that each of that is one image. Okay, it doesn't have to be it's actually packets, but you can assume there are one image. So 30 frames per second means image has to be sent every 33 milliseconds. Okay, that's 30 frames every second. Okay, so you are sending data at a steady rate. Every 33 millisecond, you send the next frame of the video. Okay, that's how it goes out. Now, when it goes on the internet, okay, there's no control. Okay, you may have arbitrary delay. In this case, there is no loss. Let's assume that packets are not lost, but they're subjected to arbitrary delay. So the second line shows you the, the how the packets are arriving at the client. Okay? So you see that the first packet arrived fairly quickly, then there was a big gap. The second packet arrived because longer delay. There's another gap. Next two packets arrived quickly, then more gap. And so that's how actually packets are going to be received at your on your browser, let's say you're watching YouTube. Okay? Server did a good job of sending data steadily. Okay? Network did a bad job by delivering data with different amounts of delay. That's jitter. Okay? Because each packet is seeing different amount of delay. Okay? Now, if you simply start at playing the video, as soon as the first image arrived, see what is going to happen. You start playing the video, you play the first image, okay? and then immediately your video is going to freeze. Because the second day image hasn't arrived. It has to come. Once you start playing, images have to come every 33 milliseconds. Otherwise, you have a glitch. Okay? So here, if you just keep playing this every few seconds or every few milliseconds, you're going to see a glitch. Okay? 
So that if you do that, then you are going to get a very bad experience from the user's perspective. Okay. So what are you going to do? Okay. So use a simple approach, which is called buffering. Okay. So you essentially in the client put a memory buffer and you don't start playing the video as soon as data starts arriving in the network. You let some data come in, you accumulate some amount of data, then you start playback. Okay. So in particular, you see now the third line here says when the playback actually starts. You will see in this case, playback has started 10 seconds after you started receiving the video. Okay? Not as soon as you hit play, you wait for some time, in this case 10 seconds, maybe it's too long, uh, but maybe it's five seconds, doesn't matter. But you will see in this case it's 10 seconds. So you have accumulated six packets by this point in time. Okay? Because six packets have already arrived. So you now start playing back. Okay. So play the first packet, second packet, third packet, buffer is beginning to drain. At this point, no packet, additional packets have arrived. You're six in the buffer. You played three out, so there are three more to go. You play the fourth packet, okay. or two packets are remaining, then the seventh one comes. Okay. So now your buffer has grown a little bit. You keep playing and you play the seventh packet here. Okay. The eighth packet took a really long time. It hasn't even come. So then here is where you see a gap. Okay. So this is where you will now freeze because even with buffering, okay, your data is not arrived on time. If the buffer is quite large, then this should not happen. You will always have some amount of data. The buffer data keeps growing and shrinking depending on the arrival rate, but you never run out of frames to play out. That is basically what all clients are going to do, whether it's Netflix or YouTube, they will basically buffer data because internet has no quality of service whatsoever. Okay. This is just an extreme case where our buffer was too small. If you had enough of a buffer, even though this is happening, data will keep coming and above you will never have what is called a buffer underflow, which means the buffer actually ran out of data to play. Okay. Buffer runs out of data, you have a glitch, even with buffering. Okay. You can never play as the data comes because that's a problem. But with buffering, you should be able to avoid this problem. But in this case, I showed you an example where even with buffering, Sometimes there are problems and then you, your player will have the spinning wheel and say buffering. Okay? It's basically pausing for more data to come because it doesn't want to play as soon as the eighth packet comes. But then again, you will have a glitch. So you want to wait for some more data to accumulate. So it's actually buffering some data. Then it starts playing again. Okay? And hopefully next time around, it made a bigger buffer. So you will not have this problem. Okay? So the amount of buffer you put in the client okay, allows you to mask all these problems that you will see when you have internet best effort delivery. Okay, there's no quality of service. If you had quality of service, you wouldn't have to do all of this. Okay, is that clear? So buffering is what we are going to use to get around all of these issues. No QoS, no token bucket, no nothing. Yet we want to ensure that you can stream on a best effort network and give good experience. Okay, so that's one. Second problem is data can also get lost. In the previous case, I said. No data was getting lost, there's just variable delay, but data can actually get lost. What are you going to do? Okay. You don't have time to wait and retransmit the data. That's just, there's not enough time. So you can do things, other things. You can send redundant information. Remember we did parity when we were doing RAID 5. Okay. You can actually do parity on packets and send an extra parity packet. So enough one packet get lost, you can reconstruct without having to retransmit. Okay. That's one approach. People use it all the time uh, for not just video streaming, other contexts. Uh, so you can send redundant packets that allow you reconstruction. So you don't need to send. That's called forward error correction. No need to retransmit. I can just actually uh, get whatever. The other thing you can do is you can scramble data so that a loss does not cause you to actually notice that data was lost. So here's an example. Okay? So the top. Uh, example is where you send 16 packets and pack uh, or 16 images rather and why one gray packet was lost so date images 9 10 11 12 were lost okay. if i just play this back without retransmission i'll play 1 through 8 okay, and then i'm going to skip because i didn't get the data i'm going to go to 213 and start playing okay. now if you actually lose four images not really noticeable to your human eye because you're playing 30 images per second. In one second, you just saw 26 images instead of 30, you can't notice it. But let's say if it's audio, you can, your ear can actually notice it because audio, you're, you're a lot more perceptible to lost data than images. 
So let's assume this is audio stream. Okay? So you lost four samples, you will actually notice a small click or something that will not sound right. Okay? So what could you do to prevent this? You could scramble data. Okay? So instead of sending data in the order one through 16, I'm going to essentially take the first packet or first sample of each of the packets, say one, five, nine, 13 gets sent, then two, six, 10, 14 gets sent, and three, so that's the order in which I'm actually going to send, okay? So I'm going to scramble and send. The gray packet is still lost, but now what I've lost is one sample from the first four, second one from here, one from here, one from here. You spread it out, okay, that's even less perceptible. So now I'm losing one sample, every out of every n samples instead of k samples that are all clustered together. Okay? So that improves your audio quality or video quality, even though I've done no retransmission at all. Okay? If you want to avoid this altogether, you send extra data, you send from parity data that allows you to reconstruct that on the fly. Okay? So you use these kinds of techniques to improve the quality because you cannot use things like TCP to retransmit normally. All right, so one more thing and we are going to be done. Okay. So the last thing I want to talk about is how streaming actually works today. Okay. So uh, there's something called HTTP streaming. Okay. So you use the HTTP protocol, which you are all familiar with, to actually stream data. Okay. So when you use HTTP streaming, you are no longer doing push-based. Because I said you do push-based, you say play and send data. So there are many protocols that do that. But in HTTP streaming, your browser or your client that is in your, let's say it's a YouTube player in your video browser or whatever the player may be, is actually making HTTP requests for the next chunk of video. Okay? So you send a get saying, send me the first N images. Then you send another get saying, you send another image, next N images and so on. And then you still buffer them and you play them out. But you are using HTTP to get small parts of the video. Okay? And your player is actually asking, using standard get request. Okay. So, but the more important part that HTTP streaming allows you to do is it allows you to change the uh, uh, video quality on the fly depending on whatever network condition. So at the server side, you create multiple versions of the video. You create a low quality one that's blue or green here, a medium quality one red, high quality one blue. Okay. They are different quality versions of the exact same movie, okay? And then you take the movie, you chop it up into what are called segments, okay? Each segment could be one second or 30 images. The first segment, second segment, say third segment and so on. Okay? So what your client player is going to do, because it doesn't know what the network conditions look like, it may say, let me start with the medium quality. So it may ask for the red quality version, okay? And if that data comes and there's no buffering, no playback glitches and so on, after a while, it might say, let me see if I can get a higher quality. Okay, it may say, let me get the blue version. Okay? And if you have enough network bandwidth, then you can start getting the blue quality, okay? which means that you will see better quality video. But maybe there's now network packet loss, so data starts getting lost. Your video player will automatically drop the quality by asking for the next segment at a lower resolution. Okay? This is where your video starts looking grainy. Okay? Sometimes you watch video, YouTube video, you'll see that the video becomes grainy and then it improves again. Okay? The reason that's happening is your video player has decided that there is packet loss, so better to not have playback glitch. Let's get a lower quality one and keep playing. And then when the network condition improves, I'm going to then go get a higher quality. Okay? So you can switch dynamically between low quality and high quality video every few seconds as you fetch each segment using get. Because all you have to do is, for the next get, you just specify what quality you want. So you want the blue one, the red one, or the green one. And that's what the server will send you. And it's the player's job to decide what quality video it wants. Okay? This is called adaptive streaming. Because you're changing the bitrate of the video or the quality of the video on the fly. Okay? Again, techniques that are put in place because the network doesn't guarantee you anything. Okay? You have to do buffering. You have to change the video quality on the fly play all of these tricks to get us uh, a good quality experience. Okay, so, so this is HTTP streaming. The term that you will hear is actually called DASH streaming, which is direct adaptive streaming for HTTP. That's the protocol that you see today. Okay? This is what every streaming service actually uses.
to deliver content over the net. Okay, so I think that is the last slide. So I'm going to stop here, and then we will uh, actually be done with the course. As I've already announced, exam is on Friday. Okay, I already sent some instructions today. Make a note of the room number. Don't go to the wrong room. It's not the same room as the midterm. Different classroom. Okay, so Friday one o'clock. Okay? We'll see you there. I have office hours. If you have any questions today, tomorrow, ask on Piazza. Okay, and we are happy to answer any last-minute questions here. Okay? So with that, let's end the course here. I just hope all of you had a good experience, and I hope to see you at the exam, and then stop by afterwards if you have any comments to offer. Okay? All right. Let's stop here. Thanks.